ultimate, unforgettable. Feel good. You need more. Make your dreams come true. Simple, easy. Complete satisfaction. You can have it all. Power. Set your spirit free. Magic. Escape. Sexy. Alive with pleasure. The perfect body. Relax. You need more. You deserve love. Exciting. Have it all. If I'm bored, or it's a day when I feel very bad about myself, the first thing I think of doing is, well, maybe I'll go to the shopping mall, and if I could just get to that mall and buy something new, I'm sure I'll feel better. The less you have, the more emotionally stable you are, because there are less things consuming you. The problem with our defining ourselves by our job and the work we do is that when we are not doing it, we lose ourselves. So when we lose ourselves, we have to be finding something else to do. And very often, the whole business of consumerism is filling that gap. TV is a drug. I really think it is. It draws you in. It saps your mind. Uh, it feeds you messages that you maybe wouldn't be feeding yourself. And after a while, you don't hear it and see it anymore. You just accept it. Consumerism is all around us. We can't get away from it. Uh, in my neighborhood, there are billboards. I mean, people look at TV all day, and you're constantly bombarded with what to have, what to want. Everything glitters in America. For many, life is more crowded than it used to be. There is more to experience, more to buy, more than we can fit into our lives. Our families, our spiritual lives, meaningful work, rest, all are crowded out by the demands of getting through the day. Not enough sleep, not enough money, too much pressure and stress, too many bills to pay. We are convinced that if we buy one more this or one more that, we'll be happy. But time after time, we are disappointed. America's a real difficult country, I think, to exist in and not be a consumer. And it takes a great deal of, of, of fortitude and strength to say no to all the temptations that are thrown in front of you. Because if you don't, you will constantly want. And that's not the answer. That's not the answer. The difference between want and needs is that when you take care of a, of a need, it's satisfied my need for shelter, food, you know, transportation. But when I take care of a want, there's always one right behind it. And as soon as I satisfy one want, there's something else kind of screaming out, buy me, get me, have me. And I never satisfy that. I never quench that thirst. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And you that earn wages, earn wages to put them in a bag with holes. The fact is that the culture we have created is not just damaging to our individual lives, it affects all of creation. The environment suffers, other people suffer. Our souls suffer. If you are poor in a consumerist society, you develop quite a bit of anger when you don't consume. Because you do see everybody else consuming. And that anger can turn into violence. We're all stewards on this earth, to me, and it's a matter of how much do I take for what I want? How much do I see that I need and then therefore try to go after? A lot of people have tendencies to be people pleasers and so we get involved, we say yes to too many things, we don't help each other to say no. Sometimes I think we secretly like the fact that we're asked to be so busy because we, we derive our worth from it. 
American lifestyle is just fast paced. We have to accomplish so much, we have to do so much, we have to compete and keep up with our neighbors. If our neighbors need a new car, we have to get a new car. If our neighbors take a vacation, we have to take a vacation. So what you end up doing is not being yourself, you sort of emulating others to keep up with them to say, I've done something, you know, and it's sort of, it's not a real you. We just didn't feel good, and we were young, and we were supposed to feel good, and we remember saying, you know, why aren't we feeling the way that we th think we should feel? Uh, we both had CAT scans for headaches, and we did the whole medical thing, and we finally just decided it was the way that we were choosing to live our life. And everything we were doing was wonderful. All the things we volunteered for, the work we did was, was terrific. It was all meaningful, but it was too much. And I've come away with a question that I have yet to hear a, a good answer to, and that is, who ever told us that we're supposed to burn ourselves out for the Lord? How do we change our direction? How can we change our relationship with a culture that pressures us so constantly? How can we become individuals and communities that are accountable to God and the whole of God's creation? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. In the Native American community, we often say that there is much noise in the universe. Some of it is empty noise. Some of it is noise that feeds the soul. And if it feeds the soul, it feeds also the entire being. And by feeding the entire being, it feeds the entire creation. We spend all of our time acquiring things, possessions, and protecting our possessions. And sometimes it takes real tragedies in life to bring us to the point where we understand what really counts, and that is friends and family and helping other people. It's not that people can't have things or own things, it's that we don't want the things to own us. And that's the problem that we had. Our things had started to own us and we were working to have the things. And I think when people um, overextend themselves emotionally or uh, financially or overextend themselves time-wise, uh, they're really putting themselves in little prisons. That's what things are. They're only for a moment and after that, you're looking for something else to fill that void. And I think you have to find it within yourself and in the relationship with a higher being, a higher spirit. I think our motivation should be to do what we love doing and that, we've, um, that we don't pay ourselves back with dollars but with gratification about where we make our mark. Um, are we affecting some kind of change or are we being life-giving to people around us? If we're understanding that everything around us is a gift, a created gift, then we tend to handle it with more gentility than we do when we think something is just a material possession that we can discard. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that I need. But how do we live this out? If we believe the Bible, how can we translate it into our daily lives? It's a scary prospect to think of changing our lifestyle without knowing what will happen as a result. How can we find joy? Where do we begin? Credit cards probably are inherently evil. Now, it doesn't mean that I don't have them, but that's also why I know. Uh, it makes things too easy. We, uh, very, we, it, it makes it easy for us to do irresponsible things. That if we didn't have a credit card, if we didn't have a, a, a ready, ready cash flow, so to speak, that we would have to think about it, we would have to plan for it, we'd have to decide whether it's important enough to save money to do. Not choosing to go into debt uh, a lot, not choosing um, to buy a house that would just cost a lot of money, or or to buy a fancy car. And for me, there was freedom with that because when you don't have the bills and you don't have the monthly payments, you can think about other things, like what you want to do with your time. After we got so overextended in so many ways, we sold the house and moved down 
decreasing our payments and taxes and everything by more than half. And the best thing that did was to buy us time. We didn't have to work as many hours, both of us full time. And so it bought us time with our family. And our kids already were learning that we may have less money and can't keep up with the other families in, in purchasing clothing, for instance, with certain names on it. But I remember my daughter saying, but we have our dad back. And that made it worthwhile. Often the most simplest things are the most treasured things. And one of the most treasured things today is time. And we feel that in order to be productive often or in order to feel our, our self-worth that we always have to be busy. Busy doing things or busy keeping up or having full agendas or being on this board meeting or, or going to this church meeting. When in reality that has very little to do with how we love or reaching out to help someone else or having special places and time in our day for God. It's hard to tell somebody who has not had that having it won't solve the problem. You have to have the experience um, or some type of experience that brings you to a realization that it's not about things. I find it's a real sense of liberation for me to understand that no matter what comes into my parameters, into my personal space, that I have an opportunity to say yes or no. And if I say no, very often it may not be no, never again, but no, this is the right thing, but this is not the right timing. Well, kids are kids, and they do want things. Uh, and so we try to oblige them to a point we, we practice a game when we go shopping. They can like as much as they want. I like it, I like it, I like it is fine. I want it, I want it, I want it is not fine. And I think that has been helpful um, because they can like as much as they want, but you don't have to own everything you like. When our daughter Rose was 13, she wanted to get a job so she could earn some money. But she also was interested in candy striping at one of the local hospitals here. So we told her, we said if she volunteered for every hour that she volunteered, we would give her a dollar towards school clothes. So she volunteered 268 hours that summer, treated it like it was a 40-hour week, was able to buy all her own school clothes, which meant she had to decide what was important, an $80 pair of sneakers or three outfits. Simple Life ought to be described with words like celebrative or Eucharistic living, instead of, instead of feeling that it's uh, confined and a great poverty, um, let's open it up into the fullness that it is. The world cannot give an American lifestyle to all of its inhabitants. Uh, we need to do some evening out in the world, and I think um, voluntary simplicity is a nice place to start. It's not an easy task to struggle against a culture so solidly based on buying and consuming. I still suffer with seeing things that I think I want, but now I take time and I realize that I really don't want them. And that's a good feeling. It's not easy to walk against the prevailing winds, but our lives, the life of the world, depends on a conversion of the spirit, a transformation of the mind that will begin to set straight the twisted tangle of whom we have become as a people. For what counts in the end is people living in a global community perched on a dazzling God-given blue planet delicately set in space. For thus saith the Lord, Ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. Break forth into joy, sing together, for the Lord hath comforted the people. <laughs>